For the ones that did not see our 1000 subscriber celebration, here it is. And thanks again for the support. A few weeks ago I asked you what of four elements you would like us to discuss and you chose phosphorus. Now this element is known for its dangerous properties so let's dive into this very colorful and diverse element. Welcome to Cube Chemistry where we will discuss all the elements of the periodic system and also do experiments. And if you like this video and want to see more make sure to subscribe. Next week we will do a special episode about the periodic table again so make sure not to miss it. Now what we see in this cube seems to be some type of red stones, almost like clay. But this is phosphorus in its red allotropic form. Now why do I say red form? Phosphorus is an element that can have multiple appearances. And why that is, we will discuss in detail. Now phosphorus has element number 15 and symbol P. Now this is again a very special cube and like always if you want to collect this element for yourself click on the link in the description and use the code. You will receive a 10% discount and will also be helping our channel. Now the story of phosphorus begins in 1669 with German alchemist named Henning Brandt. Now knowing that phosphorus is highly flammable and knowing that in Dutch Brandt means fire it is a funny coincidence that this man discovered the element. Now, Brandt being an alchemist meant that he was, of course, like all alchemists, searching for the Philosopher's Stone. He started experimenting with urine, and this is what he did. Now, he first collected some urine. Brandt believed that human urine contained vital elements that could lead to the creation of gold. He collected large quantities of urine, reportedly from soldiers. Brandt then wanted to concentrate this substance and the urine was allowed to stand until it began to decompose. He boiled it down to reduce it to a thick syrup. Now then he went on with distillation. The concentrated syrup was heated further in a closed distillation apparatus and then the heating process aimed to separate and isolate the different components. Then he went on with reduction with carbon. Brandt mixed the concentrated urine residue with sand and carbon, likely in the form of charcoal. He heated the mixture intensely in a furnace this heating process caused a chemical reaction. Now during this high temperature reaction, phosphorus gas was released. The gas condensed into a solid waxy substance, which Brandt collected. This substance glowed in the dark and burned spontaneously in air, which fascinated Brandt. Now there were two key observations. First, this substance, which Brandt named phosphorus, meaning light bearer in Greek, exhibited a mysterious property. It glowed in the dark. This luminescence was caused by a slow reaction with oxygen in the air, a process called chemiluminescence. Now the second thing that he observed was its combustibility. It ignited spontaneously in air, which made it both remarkable and extremely dangerous. Now this strange discovery marked phosphorus as the first element to be chemically discovered since ancient times. And its discovery became a landmark in the history of chemistry. Now, after Brandt's discovery, phosphorus quickly captivated the scientific community. European alchemists and chemists sought to replicate Brandt's work and find practical uses for this luminous element. Phosphorus found its way into early experiments with matches and fireworks due to its ability to ignite spontaneously. However, the challenge of working with phosphorus became evident. White phosphorus, the form that Brandt had discovered, is highly toxic and dangerously reactive. This made it both a marvel and a hazard for early scientists. Over the centuries, phosphorus transitioned from a chemical curiosity to a cornerstone of modern chemistry. The 18th and 19th centuries saw an advancement in understanding its chemical behavior, and by the 20th century, phosphorus has become a vital component in fertilizers, industrial chemicals, and even munitions. Now, the name phosphorus originates from the Greek word phosphoros meaning light bringer or light bearer. This term aptly describes the element's glowing characteristic, which made it seem almost magical to early observers.
Interestingly, the term phosphorus also had a celestial connection in ancient Greek culture. It was used to describe the planet Venus when it appeared as the morning star, shining brightly before sunrise. This dual symbolism of light and mystery perfectly aligns with phosphorus properties. The glowing nature of phosphorus has inspired myths, scientific inquiry and even fear. During the 19th century it was sometimes referred to as the devil's element due to its fiery nature and its association with war. Phosphorus was used extensively in bombs. Now, phosphorus occurs in several allotropes or different structural forms, each with unique properties. So let's dive into the most significant ones. So let's start with white phosphorus, a waxy white solid, highly reactive, glows in the dark due to chemiluminescence and ignites spontaneously in air. Historically it's used for matches and as a compound in incendiary weapons. Extremely toxic and must be stored under water or inert gases to prevent accidental combustion. Then we have red phosphorus, a red powdery substance, more stable and less toxic than white phosphorus, we can see it in the cube. And it's commonly used in the production of safety matches, fireworks and flares. And then we have black phosphorus, a dark crystalline material. It is the least reactive allotrope, with a layered structure resembling graphite. It also has potential applications in electronics as a semiconductor. And then we have violet phosphorus, a purplish solid, rare and it forms under specific conditions. Now this is mostly used out of scientific interest. Now phosphorus in general is highly reactive and does not occur freely in nature. Instead it is found in the form of phosphates, minerals containing phosphorus combined with oxygen. It readily combines with other elements making it a versatile component in chemical reactions. Now it is interesting to mention that phosphorus is an exemption to the rule that gaseous elements consist of molecules made up of two atoms. The gas is P4 in the form of a tetrahedron. Another exception is sulfur, S8, which is ring shaped. And of course the noble gases. At sufficiently high temperatures these larger molecules break down into diatomic molecules. But ultimately everything breaks down if you make it hot enough. Even diatomic ones. It seems that white phosphorus still consists of P4 molecules that are rarely separated from each other. However, these can react with neighboring P4 molecules to form a solid crystal, thereby creating red phosphorus. Now, also very remarkable, although it may go too deep, is that the phosphate ion PO4 can cluster into polyphosphate by sharing one or more oxygen atoms. Now, this bond isn't very strong because the phosphate groups are quite negatively charged and repel each other. Phosphoric acid is H3PO4, so the phosphate ion is triply negative and when connecting by discharging a doubly negative ion, only part of the charge is lost. Terrestrial life takes advantage of this by using ATP, adenosine triphosphate, as an energy carrier. It contains two phosphate-phosphate bonds which release energy when broken in favor of forming another bond, usually with water. Now, above makes it clear that phosphorus is the cornerstone of life on Earth. It plays a critical role in several biological processes. And saying that phosphorus is important for the development of roots, seeds and fruits feels like an understatement. It is, after all, an essential component of every living cell. And it's not found in the air. No form of plant growth would be possible without extracting phosphorus from the soil. Also crucial for life is the fact that the phosphate-phosphate bond, while weak, is not very reactive. There is a famous paper on the origin of life titled Why Nature Chose Phosphates. The crux is that uh, to free phosphate groups from a polyphosphate, you need to supply an oxygen ion. In an aqueous solution, this must come from water. But H2O is a strong electrical dipole and the oxygen atom is on the negative side. Therefore, around the polyphosphate group, the water molecules align with their hydrogen side facing the phosphate and their oxygen side turned away. This makes the reaction extremely slow and difficult. And this is essential for the stability of DNA and RNA. In these molecules, the phosphate group serves as a linkage for the units in the chain via oxygen atoms from the OH group of sugar. 
After losing a H+, this becomes only single negative, instead of a purely negative oxygen ion. Thus, two of the original three charges are already compensated, leaving only one perphosphate group in DNA. It's essentially H3PO4, where two of the H atoms have been replaced by sugars, making it sugar, HPO4, sugar. The remaining H then disassociates as H+. Since it's still an acid, as the name nucleate acid suggests, and what is left is still negatively charged. If you were to link the sugars via sulfate groups, for example, there would be no H left. Sugar, SO4, sugar, wouldn't be able to be an acid anymore, and it would remain neutral. This would make it easier to pick up an oxygen from a water molecule and fall apart. Now it's also used for energy transfer. Adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency of cells, relies on phosphorus for its high energy bonds. Calcium phosphate is a major component of bones and teeth, providing them with strength and structure. Now, like mentioned before, one of the most important applications of phosphorus is agriculture. Phosphorus-based fertilizers such as superphosphate and ammonium phosphate are essential for plant growth. They provide the nutrients necessary for photosynthesis, energy transfer and root development. Phosphorus is also the key ingredient to numerous industrial products. Now we use it for instance for matches and pyrotechnics. The safety aspect of the safety matches isn't so much due to the color of the phosphorus, but due to the fact that it's not in the match's head, but on the striking surface of the box. The head contains sulfur and potassium chloride. The reason red phosphorus is used instead of white phosphorus is likely because white phosphorus reacts too quickly with oxygen in the air, rendering the striking surface ineffective. We also use it for detergents. Phosphates were historically used as detergents to soften water and enhance cleaning power. However, environmental concerns have led to reduce the usage in this sector. Now we can also probably use it for semiconductors. Black phosphorus shows promise as a material for next generation electronic devices due to its excellent electrical properties. And we also use it in the military. White phosphor has been used in munitions and smoke screens, though its use is controversial due to its toxic effects. Now phosphorus is a critical nutrient in ecosystems, but excessive amounts can cause problems. Agriculture runoff containing phosphates can lead to eutrophication, where water bodies become enriched with nutrients, causing harmful algal blooms or oxygen depletion. White phosphorus, a highly reactive and toxic substance, poses a significant environmental and public health challenge in the Baltic Sea region. Historically, this compound entered the sea through two primary avenues. Now, the first cause is munition dumping in post-World War II. In the aftermath of World War II, vast quantities of munitions, including those containing white phosphorus, were disposed of in the Baltic Sea. This practice was part of efforts to demilitarize and eliminate surplus of weaponry. Now, the second reason are incendiary bombs. During the war, incendiary bombs containing white phosphorus were deployed extensively. Misfires and misdirected bombs led to the contamination of certain areas, notably near the German island of Usdom, where approximately 1.2 tons of white phosphorus entered the sea. Now, white phosphorus is notorious for its incendiary properties. Igniting spontaneously upon exposure to air at temperatures between 20 to 40 degrees and burning at temperatures up to 1300 degrees. This characteristic makes it particularly hazardous when washed ashore. Now, notably, chunks of white phosphorus can resemble amber, a gemstone commonly found along the Baltic beaches. Beachgoers mistake these dangerous pieces for amber, having suffered severe burns upon handling them. Now, the southern Baltic Sea, especially regions in Germany, Poland, Latvia, are areas of concern. Beaches in these countries have reported incidents where white phosphorus has been washed ashore, posing risks to the public. Now, to address these dangers posed by white phosphorus in the Baltic Sea, several measures have been implemented. Public awareness campaigns, authorities have erected warning signs on the affected beaches, educating the public about the risks of mistaking white phosphorus for amber and advising caution. Also, there is beach monitoring and cleanup. Regular monitoring and cleanup operations are conducted to identify and safely remove white phosphorus from the beaches, reducing the risk of accidental contact. 
Organizations like the Helsinki Commission, HELCOM, have documented the presence and risk of sea-dumped chemical munitions, including white phosphorus, to inform policy and safety measures. White phosphorus indeed poses a significant health risk. Exposure can cause severe burns, organ damage and even death. Its use in consumer products is now highly regulated, with safer forms like red phosphorus preferred for most applications. Phosphorus is a truly remarkable element, straddling the boundary between life and destruction. From its mysterious discovery in the laboratory of an alchemist to its role in modern technology and agriculture, phosphorus has shaped human history and the natural world alike. Understanding its properties, applications and challenges allows us to harness its potential response. Now as always, if you think I missed something in this episode, let me know in the comments and if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. See you next week.